Good morning. Everybody get a good night's sleep last night? Go out for a nice walk in the morning? fresh air? We're back, and we're here for the last day of the Code for America Summit. Um, we've got another jam-packed day for you with all kinds of activity here on the main stage, more breakout sessions, more lightning talks, the civic tech timeline happening in the hallway. We'll close out the day with a town hall and a live recording of the Gov Love Live podcast featuring our voice of God. And um, as ever, thank you very much to our partnering sponsors, Accenture and Medallia. And, um, oh, right, session evaluations. Super, super important. Um, thank you very, very much if you've already been filling them in. Um, as ever, uh, the more data, the more information that we get about how our sessions have been going, the better that we can do next year. So, without... We have, yeah. What, yeah are we, we ready yeah, to go? I think we're are we ready. ready to go? Yeah. Should we get this party started? Um, this morning, we're starting out with a Digital Service State of the Union, uh, remarks from U.S. Digital Service Administrator Matt Cutts. So please welcome Matt to the stage. Go get him. All right. Hello. Welcome. So everybody got a good amount of sleep. I had a weird dream that like at 2 a.m. there was a woman who was like, the building alarm has been activated. I had trouble sleeping through that. It was very strange. Okay, but we're all fresh now. We're all fresh as daisies. Everybody on the live stream, we had a, we had a little bit of a uh, fire alarm at 2 a.m., which led to a bunch of civic technologists at 2.30 a.m. debating the best way to get everybody back up to the room. Do you group by floor number or do you go in a line and first come, first served? It was... It was wonderful. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that's happening at the federal level and the U.S. Digital Service. And I've timed it. And to give a full accounting of all the stuff that's happening takes about an hour. And I do not have an hour. So I apologize to all the folks on our team that work with doctors and patients, small businesses, firefighters, asylum seekers, farmers. We're not going to get to talk about all of that, although if you come to the booth and say hello, they would have folks who would love to talk about that sort of thing. But I do want to tell uh, just a few stories. So often we get the question, is the U.S. Digital Service about firefighting or is it about culture change? And the answer is both. So I, I wanted to share an example of a firefight that we had recently. Uh, there's a system that does background checks for the government. Um, it was recently put on the government accountability office's high risk list because it hasn't been going that well. So there's a system, took six years to build, over a million lines of code in Java, and there's one basic problem. It's really slow. Like click a button to download a document and then go make coffee, kind of slow. Um, and there's one problem with that, which is you don't need 200 cups of coffee per day. You only need maybe five tops, and then you'll still be jittering like this, right? So we brought in a group of four or five folks uh, with backgrounds ranging from Akamai to Facebook to Amazon, and we said, look, this is really slow. What can we do? How can we make things better? And the team added application monitoring, and then they sort of said to themselves, okay, what else is going wrong? And I won't... I won't go into all the details about all the different ways that it was slow, but they did find a completely extra document management system, like one that was not used. So the metaphor I like to use is if you go to a filing cabinet and you open it up and you pull out the file folder and then you look inside and there's another file folder inside of that file folder. And it turns out you don't need every single file to be nested twice within a file folder. So they ripped that part out. They made sure that big documents that were already compressed don't have to be compressed. And the net throughput changed from about a minute to download a document to two or three seconds. And so the net effect of that is instead of doing about 12,000 background checks per week, they were able to do 24,000 background checks per week. And it settled down at about, yes, yes, good throughput, hello, huzzah. And, and even after a few weeks, it settled down at 18,000 background checks per week. Now, what does that mean? Well, they have about 1,000 people who are using this system on a daily basis. 
So that means you don't need to hire an extra 500 people because with a few weeks of productivity, you're able to get 500 people's worth of productivity with just a little bit of improving code. That's a huge difference. That makes a, like tens of millions of dollars, no matter how you slice it. And those kinds of wins are the sorts of things that remind people, yes, technology matters. It matters to be able to make this sort of thing work well. But we're not just about firefighting. I wanted to tell a, a story about something that we've been doing at the Department of Veterans Affairs, or the VA. Um, we started out, and we worked on a really cool website. It was called vets.gov, and it lets you refill prescriptions. It lets you talk to your doctor. You could discover, apply, track, and manage all your benefits. But there was one problem. Even though the site worked very well, I talked to my aunt. My aunt deals with a lot of veterans. And even we, though we had a chance to talk to thousands of veterans and design with users instead of for them, which is one of our core values, I tried to explain, okay, go to this website. It's called vets.gov. And she got out her pencil and she got out her pad and she's like, okay, I'm going to write this down. This sounds really useful. What's the URL? And I'm like, vets.gov. And she's like, okay, vets.com. I was like, no, no, not Vets.com. I don't even know what that is. It could be a porn site. Don't go to Vets.com. <laughs> Vets.gov. I'm a government employee. Did that not? Okay. And I realized as much as you can optimize and create momentum, which is another one of our core values, it's really, really nice if you're on that critical path where all veterans are going. VA.gov. And so as a result of being engaged with Veterans Affairs for years, as a result of talking to veterans, thousands of them, combat veterans in Oklahoma, all across the country, we had the opportunity to work with the VA and a fantastic set of contractors to help build out the new VA.gov. Previously, the VA homepage was about the structure of the VA. Now, it's about veterans. That's the most important thing. Yeah. <laughs> And so if you look at the top 20 tasks that veterans want to do, they're all there on the homepage. It makes a huge difference to not have to navigate, I, I need records, I don't know which organization provides these records, maybe I can just use some plain language kind of thing to find out where I should be. So it's, it's the result of years of work, it's the result of a lot of strategy, and the fantastic thing is that veterans love it. It really helps them get the services that they need. The interesting thing, though, is we've had those kinds of engagements, all the way from firefighting to the sort of time where you've been able to develop stuff that, the way that it should be developed. But a lot of people say, that's great, but those are individual projects. How do you have more scale? How do you have an impact across the entire federal government? And so one of the things that we've been working on is procurement. Like, that is the secret about how to make things better in government, is if you can fix procurement. And so a lot of folks might have had the chance to hear Tracy Walker talk about what we call the digital IT acquisition professional DITAP. Everything has to have an acronym in government, but at least DITAP is pretty good. Uh, MIDAS is an acronym that exists in literally every government agency, but it's always a different system. Um, so DITAP will have trained 250 different acquisition professionals, contracting officers, to be able to write better contracts so that we're less likely to have $100 million boondoggles whenever we're trying to buy technology. It's a contracting officer who helps you write the sort of contract that lets you do the first bug bounty in the federal government, hack the Pentagon. So that is one area where you can have a lot more impact and scale. Something that we've also been looking at over the last year is fixing hiring. Does anybody have problems with hiring in their government entity? Is that, no, none? Everybody's good, okay, great. Um, we have seen a lot of technologists, whether they be designers or product managers or engineers, come in and just run into a ton of paper cuts, including in the hiring process. So it turns out in the government, there's this myth that if somebody submits a resume that is 104 pages long, you have to read the whole resume. So we actually got this 
HR delegated examiners, HR Bible. It's, it's basically like this is the canonical thing that you are allowed to say. And you can say, we're going to stop reading after two pages. Huge difference for people who don't want to read 100 pages of resume from every single candidate. Something that we do whenever we hire in the U.S. Digital Service is we also say, look, let's get the subject matter experts to review the resumes. That's not always the case in government. Sometimes you have human resources folks who are not really completely familiar with the job looking first to say whether somebody's qualified. So we're trying to bring some of those practices to say, you know what? Let's have the resume reviewed by the right person. Let's have interviews ha happen with subject matter experts. And as a result, you can get a higher quality of candidate and make things work a little bit better. Uh, we have a saying, our, our director of design likes to say that you are somebody else's imposter syndrome. It is definitely the case that we don't know how to make all of this work, right? This is, this is a new territory as far as technology goes. None of us figure out exactly how to do it, but we figure out how to do it better by talking to each other, sharing our learnings, sometimes crying on each, so each other's shoulders, and also just coming to convenings like this. Because as our former director of engineering, Amanda Micklick, used to say, this is a weird job. It's really strange. And so it's also incredibly exciting to see the kinds of things happening, not just at the U.S. Digital Service. There's so much going on. Think about 18F. They are also celebrating their fifth anniversary this year. The Technology Transformation Service has done things like the U.S. web design system that makes it easier to build web pages. We have a shared project called login.gov that makes it easier to have a single sign-on. So if you apply for a, a job with the federal government, you are using that system that we built together with the Technology Transformation Service. There's a group called Tech Congress that's trying to bring technical people into Congress, which we need a little bit more of. Yeah, get a what-what for that. There's a group called Coding It Forward that's trying to bring college students in so that they can participate in internships in the federal government. Yes, let's get folks hooked on that early. And that's just at the federal level. Like, we've had the Canadian Digital Service. There's states. There's so many states that are starting to build up this, this capacity. It's happening at the municipal level, at the county level, at the city level. I got to meet the, uh, the recorder of deeds for the city of St. Louis yesterday. Like, all of these folks are waking up. And, and they're showing up, and they are here, and it's incredible. Um, I just want to take one minute to, to talk about the you are somebody else's imposter syndrome. I do something called 30-day challenges, where I'll try something new for 30 days. And at one point, I decided to try a six-month challenge. I said, let's run a marathon. And I met some friends, and we got hooked, and we have been continuing to run marathons. In fact, at one point, we decided to do a triathlon. So I ran in this triathlon, and I am the world's slowest runner. And I'm also the world's slowest swimmer and the world's slowest biker. So I ran in this triathlon, and I was 109 out of 111. No, I'm not kidding about being slow. Yes! <laughs> and I was feeling a little bit bad about that. I'm like, there was one 80-year-old guy who just, like, smoked me. He just went right by me, right? But the fact is, uh, I was talking to a friend, and they said, you know what? You still beat everybody who stayed on the couch that morning. So for all of the people here today, for all of the people watching on the live stream, thank you so much for being here. You are the people who are showing up, who are doing the work, and most importantly, you are modeling for the next generation of people who are going to come and make things even better for people. Thank you so much, and I'm really excited to see what's happening the rest of the day. Appreciate it.
join us in welcoming Nigel Poor and Erlon Woods, co-creators and hosts of the podcast Ear Hustle, in conversation with journalist and artist Sarah Sherd. Oh, shit. All right. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, we're here to have a, a conversation today, get to know each other a little better. <laughs> um, I want to introduce Erlon Woods and Nigel Poor, um, the co-hosts and creators of an amazing podcast called Ear Hustle. That's what's up. <laughs> It's a critically acclaimed podcast that's won all kinds of awards, and it's really looking at the daily life of the, some of the over two million people that are incarcerated in our country, um, what their experience is like inside, and then what their experience is like post-incarceration. So if you haven't checked it out yet, definitely check it out. It's hilarious, poignant. There's stories from what it's, how prisoners make pets in their cells, to, um, that, are, that can be hilarious and also really profound and really, really deep and difficult and moving stuff that is important for all of us to know about in the outside, like what it's like to lose a child when you're incarcerated. So definitely check it out. Um, I want to start by asking you, Erlan, why Ear Hustle? What's the name mean? Ear Hustle. So the name Ear Hustle stands for, I mean, means pretty much eavesdropping in on someone else's conversation. And a lot of people do a lot of that in prison. Yes. <laughs> and Nigel, can you explain to us a little bit the genesis of the project? How did it start? How did you guys meet? Yeah, definitely. I just want to comment on one thing you said about it being hilarious. And I'm actually glad that you opened with that because one of the things the podcast tries to do is talk about how life on the inside has a lot of connections to life on the outside. And people who don't have experience in prison seem to expect that everything inside is only depressing, that it's one emotional note. And we really like to forefront that life inside is as complicated as it is outside, and that includes humor and things that are difficult. So thank you for doing that. Um, so Ear Hustle came out of a project that Erlon and I were working on, a radio project inside San Quentin. San Quentin has a media lab that hosts a newspaper, a radio program, video, and now uh, a podcast. So in 2013, Erlon, we started working together. 12. 2012. Um, uh, on the radio program, we did that for a couple years, and we both found that we wanted to do something a little bit different than traditional journalism, um, something that was more from the perspective of an artist, something that would allow us to use more complicated sound design and, and ambi. And so we just plotted the idea of a podcast. We got permission from the prison, and then we entered a podcast contest that was put out by Radiotopia. And Pod you like West. to tell this part. So, <laughs> so we entered a contest called PodQuest that was hosted by Radiotopia from PRX. And um, out of 1,537 other teams out in 53 different countries, we ended up winning. And by, yeah. oh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, when we won, I think the prison was like, oh, we really got to do this now. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, I think we, we all felt that way because Erlon and I hadn't done a podcast. And exactly when we won, we're like, oh, dang, we got to figure out how to make a podcast now. <laughs> oh, yeah, we didn't know how to do podcasts either at the time. So Remember, you thought it was easy. Uh, we, we only had like one minute, no, two, a two-minute promo everybody had to do. So two minutes wasn't too much. Yeah. And how many people are on your team? Because I, I have some experience with podcasting myself, and most people think, oh, you just record it and you put it up. Yeah. But, I mean, podcasters I don't sleep. It's like... That is a so tremendous true. amount no, of work. We do not sleep. Um, Erlon and I are the, the, you know, the co-creators and the co-producers, but inside we have Antoine Williams, uh, who works on music. Um, David Jossi. David Jossi. So there's about four guys inside. Yeah, Pat um, Masidi Miller. Yeah, and then some outside people. But the whole team is between inside and outside people is about eight people now? About eight people. Curtis okay. Fox, Julie Shapiro, yeah. Amazing. Aaron yeah. Wade. Amazing. Yeah. Well, it's incredible. So, Erlan, you, late last year, your sentence was commuted by Governor Brown after serving 21 of 31 years that you were sentenced to for um, armed robbery. Not armed robbery, I'm sorry. Attempted. Attempted robbery. Yes. Um, attempted robbery. Attempted is a very important word. Um, so, 
first of all, I want to congratulate you on your freedom. Thank you. Appreciate it. And of course, I want to say the Honorable Governor Jerry Brown. So, you know, he's that's my right favorite on. dude right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, words are important. Indeed. Uh, so, and I also just want to say that it, it brings me it gives me great shame to think that I live in a state that would hold someone for 21 years for something um, as, as small as an attempted robbery. I'm glad you've been given a second chance, and I wish you'd been given a second chance a long time ago. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it's a lot of people still in there stuck, so. Yeah. You know. Can you tell us a little bit about how freedom has been, and mm. uh, how is this going to change Ear Hustle to have you on the outside? So I've learned that of course, freedom is not free. Everything up here is expensive, so <laughs> that's 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 what I am learning. Um, but it's been a, a you know getting out of prison, having a job, having a place to stay, having transportation, has really helped me a lot. You know, I mean that's I think the one thing is just having a job. So having a job take you out of a lot of different uh, situations, and it, and it focuses your time on something. So. Uh, for me, honestly, it's been, I've been out, I think, six months, and it's been all work. So yeah. All. <laughs> yep. Welcome a to lot of casting. work. <laughs> yeah. Well, so we're going to cue up a, a clip from Ear Hustle for everyone to listen to. We're ready for that clip now. E, your story's really different, but you also got a long sentence under the three strikes law. Yeah. 31 years to life. All right. Do you remember what was going through your mind when you first heard your sentence? What the? That's what was going through my mind. You know, you start to think the worst thoughts, you know. Your mind gets to thinking like, man, this system is racist, it's unjust, you know. I didn't even know I was a three-strike candidate. You're thinking the system is against you. That's what you're thinking, like, are oh, they fucking me? Yeah, I don't even know how you can take it in. I'll tell you what, let's go back to the yard and talk to some other three-strikers about this. Do you remember uh, what was going through your mind when you first learned of your sentence? Pain, hurt and pain. I cried. I, I couldn't critically think. I couldn't process anything. I was just overwhelmed for a year and a half later. At first, I, I was in denial. I was thinking, no, there's no way they're going to give me a life sentence at 21. And when the judge slammed the uh, gavel down and said, I'm sentencing you to life in prison, and I was just like, wow. It just totally dumbfounded me. That went blank. Uh, do you remember what was going through your mind when they first sentenced you? Life's over. It don't matter no more. And I quit caring. Life may be over, but here's what may be worse. You still have to keep on living it. And to live in this environment, you got to have some hope that you're going to get through it. It's up to each prisoner to find their own reasons to keep going. Back to Curtis. Well, you know, when I came to prison, um, the goal I set for myself was not to make it out alive. That wasn't the goal. The goal was that I didn't lose myself in the process. And um, I remember when I was going through my reception process at Tehachapi Prison, and the whites came to me and they wanted to put a knife in my hand and told me to go stab a child molester. And they said, you know, you gotta do this. You gotta prove yourself. You know, I didn't come in here stabbing child molesters. I didn't come in here being a gangbanger or a thug. Uh, I'm a stupid idiot that stole some money. I'm just not going to pick up a knife and go stab somebody. And I would rather die than lose my integrity. Wow. Indeed. It's a really powerful clip. Can I say a few things about that clip? Um, one of the things about that clip is that it highlights three things that we do in the podcast. The first is that a big part of it is the relationship that Erlon and I have and the ability to escort people into the prison. Erlon is the insider and myself is the outsider. Um, so we get to ask each other questions and challenge each other on different topics. Then we do something that's called yard talk where we go out into the yard in the prison. Um, you can see a pic, well, I guess it's not up anymore. Um, we, we have permission to go out there with microphones and recorders and we do kind of person on the street interviews where we get as many voices as possible to be part of the podcast. And in that case, we were asking different people to tell us their sentence. And then the third really important part is the first person narrative. And that story revolved around a guy named Curtis Roberts who was 
uh, serving 55 years to life for, yeah. for three strikes, and his third strike was stealing $40 out of a cash register. And he served how many years before he got a 20? 20 four years 24. before his sentence was commuted as well. Yeah, so those are the three key ingredients for the, uh, putting the podcast together. Amazing, yeah. Um, yeah, the, that clip really strikes me because it talks about how people that don't have any necessarily rational reason to feel hopeful absolutely have to find hope. Um, that quote about how um, the, the man that you interviewed said he didn't even know if he would get out, but he knew that he wouldn't let the place change him. Right. Um, and for a long time, you didn't know if he would get out, Erlan, right? For right, right. incarceration. So how did you find that in yourself, and what, what did that look like for you? And, well, how did the, and how does that relate to the podcast, if, if it does? Well, I'll say this. Um, like, when you're in prison, um, yeah, it's a, it's a crazy, chaotic environment. Um, but the one thing I held on to was uh, I was going to live my life to the best of my ability every day, no matter where I was at, because I know that the next hour, the next day is not promised to me. So I personally was like, I'm going to live my life, you know. Um, and it's, it's a lot of people in there, like me getting out uh, by the governor, and, or rather I, I would have went to the board in 2028, and that's just going in front of a board of prison terms to see if they're going to let me out. It's not, it's not you know, a promise that I'll get out that day. I could get out. I, when you have two life, that means exactly two life, you know. So it, I could have stayed in there for the rest of my life. And under the three strikes law, a lot of people may hear 25 to life, three strikes, you're out. But it's, it's dudes in there with 200 years, 300 years, 400 years to life. And that's how they were sentenced. And the crime could just be robbery. You know, it could be uh, uh, DUI, it could be anything. Mm -hmm. So, um, right. Yeah, it's kind of amazing, you know, the, that clip and the podcast it, as a whole really speaks to how can we look at um, our system of incarceration as something that could benefit people? Is that even possible, that it could be a service that helps society rehabilitate people and, and you know, help them re-enter the world mm -hmm. in a, in with more resources and yes. a, you know, more ability to, to deal with the problems of everyday life. Of course, the opposite is, is, is true in, in most cases. Um, what do you see as um, some of the stories that you've heard, what do you see as giving people inside incentive to, to become you know, their best selves, to, be, yeah. to continue to engage with society in a positive way? Yeah, I think beyond the podcast, one of the things that's very interesting about San Quentin as a specific prison, and again, this applies to San Quentin, not across the board, is that there's so many programs that happen inside. There's something like 3,000 volunteers that go in and out of the, the prison every year. And so there's a sense that there is a connection between the men or the people inside the prison and the people outside, and that, and that we're able to establish professional relationships. And I think everybody, no matter who you are, wants a life that has purpose, wants to feel like you're doing something with, with, with whatever time you have on this earth. And so for me, that's where I think inspiration comes for the guys inside and also for the people working inside. The other thing that's podcast specific that I think is inspiring is that a lot of the guys in there tell us that their family members, their daughters, their cousins listen to Ear Hustle and contact them and say, God, I have such a better idea of what happens in your life now. So it has this connective possibility. And I think that's also inspiring because connecting yeah. with people is another human directive, I believe. Yeah, exactly. And laws that are still on the books, draconian laws like this three strikes law that can you know, land you in prison for the rest of your life for nonviolent offenses. It right. doesn't help any, anyone have any kind of incentive to, to improve their lives. Right. I mean, you know, I think the, with the three strikes law, um, the main intent is to incapacitate you, yeah. you know, and there technically is no rehabilitation in the law itself. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people that are incarcerated take it upon themselves to do it. But you do still have laws like that on the books. Mm -hmm. And hopefully um, me being out here, hopefully can gather the uh, support to abolish that law. Yeah. Because you have laws on the books for the crimes people commit. It's just a three strike law is an enhancement. Right. And it's an enhancement to me that's been abused by whether it's prosecutors, whether it's judges, because like I say, 25 to life, that's just what's what's said. 
but then the sentence ends up to be up to 900, 1,000 years to life. Right. So... So we need to continue to ride this wave. There has been, you know, substantial reform in California's Correct. prison system. I focused a lot on solitary confinement, and that um, has been reduced in the state. We need to stay on that um, on that road and stay steady. So, um, so what's next for Ear Hustle? Where is it going from here? The, well, is the, the new season is going to drop soon? Ooh. Yes, Wednesday, uh, Wednesday. Hey, June next Wednesday. 5th is... Yes. <laughs> I'll say June 5th came too soon. Woo, yeah. I, I, I've been enjoying my freedom, but whew, I understand <laughs> the working people now. I understand, yeah. Seriously. So uh, things that are going to change, obviously because Erlon's out, we are doing stories about life inside and also about reentry. Um, one of my personal goals is to start doing stories that include more women's experiences in prison because like every other, yes. Every other part of, of life, women in prison also get the short end of the stick. Um, we are hoping, not this season, but next season, to start traveling to other prisons to do stories there um, and just make connections with other prisons. I wanted to say that we couldn't do this if we didn't have the support of the administration. And so what we need to do in order to spread your hustle is to make more connections, not just with people inside, but find the sympathetic people inside the Department of Corrections who are interested in working with us. And if you listen to the podcast, you hear at the end that it's always um, approved by Lieutenant Sam Robinson, who's the public information officer at San Quentin, and he's incredibly supportive. And I always think of a quote that he said about prisons, and that is that the taxpayer pays for prisons, and because of that, we have a right to know what is happening inside prison, and we have a right to try to change that. So when I hear that quote coming from someone with inside the system, um, it gives me hope that people on the outside or people that are incarcerated can form meaningful b um, bonds and try to make a difference. I don't think it's impossible. I mean, Erlon and I just started with a desire to do something, we made it happen. We're not special. We didn't have any advantage over anyone else. We just were determined. And if we can do that and make some small change, it's like there's a lot of other people that are doing it too and, and need to be you know, heard. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, there's definitely a, a growing consciousness in the state and across the country. Right. And um, it is, it, I think the story around who we put in our prisons and why has shifted towards a much more human story, a story that, you know, these are our neighbors and our friends and our family members. Right. And they're not people that we want to throw away. They're people that we need on the outside. Yeah. So um, thank you for being part of making that shift. And um, so yeah, I mean, we have a few more minutes. So as far as looking at the bureaucracy of prison and how you know, we want the DMV to run efficiently, is there a way that, I mean, because when you think of an efficient prison, does that actually benefit prisoners? Or is there, how can we make prisons more efficient as far as rehabilitating people and getting them out? I think mo mo you have to really just bring the programs to the prison because a lot of prisons don't have all the same. Like, other prisons in California is, is just not San Quentin. San Quentin offer a lot. Maybe it's because of the location of San Quentin. Right. It's in between, you know, cities, but... Because you, you were in a couple other facilities, yes, so you and, can And compare. those facilities didn't have the self-help groups. They may have had AA, NA, but, you know, uh, it's hard to get on those, those lists, you know, so as far as uh, self-help programs that, that actually help you in your life or help you identify why you went down that path, you know, causative factors and stuff like that. Uh, all prisons are probably just now starting to get there, uh, but mainly it was just basically on you to find, you know, try to find that in your life, you know, mm -hmm. try to find that help, whether it was reading a book and doing a book report or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of guys will want help but sometimes it's not offered, or it might be the prison itself, you know, the conditions in the prisons where it's just chaotic, so. Right, right, exactly. Um, and any, any last words? Any, is there a particular person that responded to the podcast in a beautiful way, a story that you want to oh, tell? This is all about yes. story, so. I have, can I, can I tell hey, the, the way you just did that, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> this, this, this is particularly beautiful. Um, we do a thing on the podcast where we ask listeners to send us letters that we can respond to. And we got a letter from a woman in Southern California whose son is serving time in a prison in Thailand. It's a pretty awful place, and they have no TV, no radio. And she said that she sends him transcripts of Ear Hustle for him to read to the other English-speaking people who are incarcerated there. 
And that story is, I mean, it almost makes me cry every time I think of it because it's such a beautiful story about connecting and that people that are so far away from us that we'll never meet are actually hearing the voices and our voices that we put in the podcast and that a mom cared enough to reach out and try to give something to her son when she can't physically be with him. And then in my mind, I have this image of him reading these transcripts to all these people. And so... Yeah, no, no, that was that was beautiful, Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, I think, just you know, if if y'all involved in institutions, volunteer, you know, because I, I always tell Nigel that volunteers are on the front line of public safety. You know, it's not the, I mean, the correction officers they do theirs, and the administration do theirs, but I think the volunteers are pretty much on the front line of public safety. Yeah, and individuals can make a difference. Yeah, yeah. Right. make a big difference. Well. Yeah. Thank you both. You're both wonderful people. Keep your ears on Ear Hustle and also just continue to engage with um, our system of uh, incarceration. We have to figure out how to do better. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you ready? We got you. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes. Over the last three decades, the number held in U.S. prisons has jumped by nearly 800 percent. California alone is pushing out 500,000 new convictions a year. Imagine where we're going to be at in 20 years. How many people are not going to be able to get jobs? How many people are not going to be able to get housing? What type of world are we going to be living in? What type of country, what type of city are we going to be living in? We love a good comeback story. And yet when it comes to people with convictions, we just cast them to the side. It seems pretty simple. You get a conviction, you serve your time, and you move on with your life, but that's not the case. The current process requires a public defender or a legal aid attorney or an attorney to be involved at the front end. It requires the district attorney to spend time reviewing records. It requires the courts to go and process every record, hold a hearing, and create documents as part of that hearing. In states across the country, it is a tiny fraction of people who actually experience that relief. In California, just under Prop 64, only 3% had petitioned the court. We in the criminal justice system were part of the problem. So I made the decision that we would do it on our own. We had cleared a little over a thousand cases by hand, spending in an average between 8 and 12, 14 minutes per case. So we reached out to San Francisco and said, hey, let's partner. Let's use Clear My Record technology to help you, government, clear these records automatically. We would not have been able to work as quickly as we did, but for this association with Code for America. So Clear My Record, as it started in 2016 and as it continues actually today in 14 counties, is an online application that somebody with a criminal record can log on to, fill out a 10-minute form, and that application connects people with attorneys in those 14 counties. Moving forward to today, we flip the question to say, why are we asking people to apply for criminal record clearance relief on their own? Isn't there a better way? Now with Clear My Record technology, we can read hundreds of thousands of lines of conviction data in just a couple minutes. And to be able to evaluate eligibility at that speed and to do that for everyone who is eligible in their jurisdiction, we move from a process that has taken years, if not decades, to one that can happen automatically. We are now in five counties using Clear My Record technology to help district attorneys determine eligibility for Prop 64 convictions and help clear people's records who are eligible without a person with a conviction having to go and petition the court. And the scale of the problem is huge. Having to process every single case individually and make every single person jump through all of these, you know, very onerous hoops to get their records cleared, we're never going to make it. The question I ask myself is, it's not what do we have to do, but who do we have to become? If we all work together, we can change the system. 
we can help every jurisdiction clear every eligible criminal record automatically. It is the right thing to do, it is a moral thing to do, and now there is a pathway that makes it easy for you to do. When we think about the very ambitious goal of clearing every eligible conviction, every state has the opportunity to do just that. In California, we are on our way there, and we are on our way there at a scale and a pace that has not been seen before, and it's really exciting. And now for A Chance to Thrive, scaling automatic record clearance across the United States. Please welcome Christine Soto DeBerry, Chief of Staff for San Francisco District Attorney George Gascon, and Yvonne Silva, Code for America's Senior Program Director for Criminal Justice and Workforce Development. Doing it. <laughs> Christine, so you played a key role in the DA's decision to clear all marijuana convictions in San Francisco. How did this come to be? Why did the office decide to do this? Yeah, you know, you heard in the video, there are over 70 million Americans with criminal records. That's greater than the population of Australia. There are over 8 million Californians with criminal records. And the video let you know over 500,000 are added every year. And as district attorneys and prosecutors, the question for us is, do we have an obligation or responsibility to look backwards mm -hmm. as we're talking about criminal justice reform and reducing mass incarceration and the effects of the war on drugs? And the answer for DA Gascon was unequivocally yes. Mm -hmm. If we want to move forward in a more humane, less carceral society, we have to look backwards as well. So when Prop 64 passed and marijuana was now legal, the question was, what did that mean for all the people and communities that we had criminalized for that same activity for decades? And to us, without some type of radical accounting for that injustice, legalization itself was not just. And so we went about trying to understand as an office what we could do to impact that, what tools were at our disposal as prosecutors to bring equity to the conversation around legalization. And that meant looking at old cases. Mm -hmm. You heard in the video, the traditional process is exceptionally onerous. You have to, one, know you have a conviction that might even be eligible. You have to know where that conviction took place and where that courthouse is. You need to likely hire an attorney, file a petition, tell my office that you would like your petition heard, schedule a hearing with the court, and have a hearing. And you would be unsurprised to know most people do not pursue that path. In fact, only 3% of people nationally take that effort. Um, the question for us, though, was we're not opposed to people getting that relief. We had made a decision that we thought those convictions should be expunged. And so we decided to do the work for them. We said, no need to ask, no need to apply. We've got it. We're going to proactively file that petition for you. Thanks. And we were so inspired by the announcement because we had seen firsthand, as you heard in the video, um, how the petition-based process doesn't des isn't designed to provide relief to everyone who is eligible today. It's not designed for the digital age. And so we developed an opt-in version and, um, in early 2016, and we were trying to solve that key issue. How can we connect an individual with lawyers across counties who would then file petitions on their behalf? And the service is live in 14 counties and has served over 12,000 people, but every county doesn't have a public defender or a legal aid attorney providing, you know, and when they do, they're not providing these post-conviction services. And even when they are, what we find is that they're at capacity and under-resourced. So folks are waiting for months to find a, a lawyer to help them through this process. And for us, we're working to clear all eligible criminal records. And so we needed to find another way to serve everyone who is eligible. And so we had to ask a different question. And so we started to build some early technology that would read a state criminal record, evaluate eligibility, and then generate the form that could be filed with the court mm -hmm. when we heard your announcement. And we, we reached out to see how we could help because perhaps there was a connection. And there was. And we wanted to help because the policy that you set out to implement, to proactively review and file petitions on behalf of individuals so that they can get that relief automatically is a really important one. 
And for us, justice is getting the implementation right. As this, as this crowd has heard us say before from this stage, especially on these types of reforms, and as we heard in the video, it's because there's so much at stake for people's lives, for our communities, for our country. And so how did it all turn out, Christine? Like, how, what was the result of our work? Well, I'll just tell you, never underestimate the value of a good question and the ideas it generates. We've made just remarkable change for San Franciscans. We'd still be at that work, frankly, with kind of stone tablets and chisels hammering away if Code for America hadn't shown up. So I can now sit here and say we're done with the work because of the technology. And really, you know, we had what I would say is a great idea, but Code for America made it an elegant one. And through our work, we were able to clear all of the marijuana convictions in San Francisco. That was over 9,361 convictions. That's great. It's great. What's more remarkable about that, though, is only 23 of those people had actually applied to have their convictions erased. So had we not engaged in this partnership and this endeavor, that's like, I'm not going to do the math, like over 9,000 people, <laughs> 9,338-ish people <laughs> that would still be walking around with a marijuana conviction on their record unnecessarily completely entitled to that relief. Uh, so that's pretty exciting. And of those people, about 33% were African Americans, 25% were Latinos. So we really did some work to start cutting away at the racial disparity that exists in our enforcement around drug activity. And maybe even most exciting, probably what you heard from Erlon too, of the convictions we took care of, 1,336 people now have no felonies on their record. The marijuana case was the only felony on their record. And another 729 have no record at all, meaning the pot case was the only thing on their record. So that's about 2,000 people that we have dramatically reduced the barriers for them to find employment, get financial aid, housing, take care of their children, all things that benefit all of us, really. It makes for a much better society. Um, so those things have just been really phenomenal and exciting to see. And then as we were kind of mentioning, it's catching on. I mean, I have to, have to save on, think we sparked a movement. <laughs> Uh, there's cities all over the country reaching out to us, Chicago, Baltimore, New Jersey, Seattle, trying to understand what we did and see if they can replicate it and leaning heavily on the policy we developed and the technology that Code for America developed to find that perfect fusion of doing this automatically and at scale. Yep, yep. So let me, tell me, Yvonne, what you ultimately built looks a lot different yeah. from when we started working together. Why is that? It is, you know, as Jen had said yesterday, we're actually now on version six of Clear My Record from the original version. Um, and the last couple of versions aren't minor changes. They're actually um, completely different products, a completely different product, because the expectations, the requirements, the, the landscape has changed dramatically. So when we started, the idea was to help your office with this ambitious idea um, and build technology so that your team didn't have to rely on paper people and overtime to get the job done. Because you had said it's an important policy, you were gonna do whatever it took. Um, and so at that time, the only way we could get data was having your staff pull criminal records one by one. And, and, that, and that takes a bit of time. As we see, it's a, it's a bottleneck in the process. And so what we were building was technology that would be centered on reading thousands of PDFs and building the technology could, that could then scan and review every page of those records to find those eligible convictions and then generate the paperwork that you would then file with the courts. But then midway through the pilot, the law changed. Right. And the law changed in a way that every county was now gonna do what you were gonna do. But they would all be receiving raw criminal history data. And so there was no need to pull records one by one, which was incredible because it solved a key bottleneck yeah. when we think about scale, when we think about how this is gonna map over to the entire state. It also meant we had to rethink our approach to how we are building technology. And so, our goal has been clear from the beginning, mm -hmm. and our goal is not to, to build a particular technology or to use a particular technology. It's to clear all eligible criminal records and to do so automatically and expeditiously so folks experience this relief. And so we built an entirely new product, um, and, and it is aimed at helping your office you know, make sense and make meaning of this massive new data set. But what it also meant is now every county in the state is gonna be able to use this technology and our work together um, to do the work that your office has already done 
and it actually sets up the courts to complete the process so that they can process the files digitally. And so for us, it was really important that we were focused on solving real problems. Because if we knew the solution at the beginning, we would have been fixated on trying to prove that our solution had value and miss some key opportunities to actually deliver value, which is really important, um, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> and so with each change, we adapted and, and applied what we had learned from the previous iteration, from what the landscape was telling us, how the law was changing, and, and worked towards that so that we were always focused on clearing as many people's records as possible automatically and as quickly as possible. And so speaking of change, I'm curious, how has this effort changed the way that your office thinks about its work, that you think about your work, and what's next for San Francisco? Yeah, it's really been a revelation for us. I know it seems obvious maybe at this point that we would do that automatically for people, but I can tell you at the moment we decided to proactively <clears throat> remove people's convictions. We were the first office in the country to do that and to think about what it meant to look backwards at the effects of mass incarceration from the role of a prosecutor. Um, and so now it has become part of what we think about as an office. After we finished the marijuana work, we asked ourselves, what else is holding people back that we have an opportunity to impact as prosecutors that would make our community safer and give individuals a better opportunity to thrive? And that, and that brought some really great thinking forward for us. We actually, <clears throat> we have a bill right now in front of the state legislature here in California, AB 1076. And what that does is really blows out the work we've been doing around marijuana and adds a whole range of other convictions that are similarly holding people back from opportunity, making it harder for them to get employment, housing, and all the things we would hope people would have when they return home. Um, that's working its way through the legislature. We would welcome your support. It will help over 2 million Californians that have a conviction on their record and millions more that have arrests that didn't result in a prosecution. Uh, so it's really critically important <clears throat> legislation. So if you're on social media, hashtag AB1076, call your legislator. And then we're really trying to think more about centering and elevating the voices of formerly incarcerated people in our own work. We spend a, thank you, yeah, you should all be doing that. <laughs> we spend a lot of time at San Quentin taking our prosecutors there to work with the men that are inside. And on the other side of that, we have a formerly incarcerated advisory board that comes to our office and advises us on the policies that we're contemplating in the office. And it has really brought refinement and, and clarity to a lot of our work. We're actually looking to hire some of those people. So if there's any funders in the room, <clears throat> please find me afterwards. I'm, I'm eager for some support there. And to any of you that are employers in the room, I really want to encourage you to think about your opportunities to make an impact here, not just with the tools that you build and create, which are dramatic, very important, but also with the employment opportunities you have. Can you hire somebody that's exiting the criminal justice system and give them a second chance. I think all of us doing that is what's going to make the difference. That's great. That's great. That's great. What's next for the Clear My Record team, Yvonne? Yeah. We're really excited. Um, as you heard the excitement I had in my voice in the video, um, the vision for Clear My Record is to clear all eligible criminal records. And the way we plan to do that is um, to expand, streamline, and automate the record clearance process. And to do that in California, as we have been in partnerships, great partnerships uh, like we have with your office, but also in states across the country. And this for us is how we start to transform the way government is delivering services to those most impacted by the criminal justice system. So in California, the pilot is setting the standard for implementation of this new law. And so we're crafting a blueprint, utilizing the lessons learned from the pilots. We are developing a tool so that all California counties can do what we've done in the pilot counties, which is really exciting. And we'll be releasing the blueprint and the tool this summer. And what that means is we are on track through the pilot to help dismiss and reduce nearly 100,000 convictions in California by the end of this year. And with the use of the blueprint and the tool, the rest, the remaining convictions, 100,000 convictions by next July, which is really exciting. And our work together has also sparked, an, you know, as you talked about, this movement, a national interest and conversation around that record relief should be provided automatically. And so we want to help design, pilot, and implement reforms in at least 10 states over the next three years, because this work is really important. The impact um, that it has on folks' lives is really 
um, much needed. And so, and we need all of you to make this happen. As Christine mentioned, there's a number of ways to get involved. If you live in California, please do support AB 1076. It's in the Senate. Call your senator. Let them know that you support it. Um, also, urge your local district attorney to do what the uh, district attorneys in our pilot have done, what Christine's office have done, to, uh, by adopting our blueprint and our tool, and make sure that they're dismissing and dismissing. I'm not going to say dismissing, and sealing all marijuana convictions in your county. They have the tool to do it. Now the question is just whether whether they will. And so your voice will be heard. So submit op eds in your local paper, tweet about this work, and your expectation that they're implementing this policy. And where you, wherever you live, states across the country are implementing and considering automatic record clearance reforms. Christine mentioned a few. So make sure if your state is doing that to lift your voice and make your voice heard in support of those reforms. They're really important. So thank you. Thank you all. And thank you, Christine. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you just get up? Next on stage, introducing Catherine Crago Blanton and Josh Rudolph from the city of Austin and 2018 Code for America fellows Brittany Lyons and Rohan Mather. As a software engineer, my job is to know how code works and how to make it run efficiently. But last year, I realized that my passion is to understand how my community works and how to make it run effectively. There are two podiums in Austin City Hall. This is where I sought the truth about what my community needed. Whether it was transportation, healthcare, education, or jobs, it always came back to affordable housing. People who are pushed out of the city lose out on the many benefits that Austin has to offer. A single mother walks into the lobby of the Housing Authority of the city of Austin. She's been on a wait list for two years, living in a car with her two children. We hand her a housing voucher and a stack of printed directories. We tell her that she has 90 to 120 days to use that voucher and that if she can't find a place, she may have to return it losing her opportunity for housing. In 2016, we had an 18% turn back rate. Whether it's a single mother, a disabled veteran, or a working family, the right housing choice is different for everyone. We want 100% of our vouchers holders to be able to use their voucher in a high opportunity area with access to the full spectrum of affordable housing but with limited resources and limited time, you might use your voucher at any property that will take it anywhere. While our focus was to solve the problems residents are facing today, I found myself wanting to understand how did we get here in the first place? Austin's housing landscape is rooted in a history of racial segregation. In the 1920s, city restrictions placed on access to services divided Austin along racial lines blocking access to mortgages and other opportunities to increase wealth. Even now, Austin has one of the highest rates of income segregation in the country. Housing prices have risen rapidly, pushing long-time low-income residents out of the city completely. This knowledge was overwhelming. The problems we wanted to tackle were still showing the effects of decisions made 100 years ago. What could we do in six months to right the wrongs of segregation and gentrification? We started simple. With the help of Open Austin, our local Code for America brigade, and the city's open data portal, we created an app that put Austin's affordable housing on a map. But it wasn't enough. People were excited about the concept, but nobody really used it, and we didn't know why. Well, before Code for America was in the picture, our local Smart City Consortium, Austin City Up, launched a housing committee with the Housing Authority of the City of Austin, the city's Neighborhood Housing and Community Development Department, IBM and other tech companies, and the LBJ School of Public Affairs. As urgent as the crisis was, we made a conscious decision not to write a single line of code until we understood who the players are and what they need. 
we asked, who are the stakeholders and what are their needs? What are the existing tools and approaches? And what are the available data? As a group, we realized the data were incomplete, disparate, and often missing some of the most crucial components. We were finally ready to write code, but we didn't have the technical resources to do so. Code for America backed our vision, strengthening the connection between two technologists and the government housing agencies. With our government partners, we discovered two critical gaps of information, one between the housing agencies, the other between the housing agencies and people searching for affordable housing. We start with a gap between the housing agencies. We discovered that each of them were collecting their own data in silos. This is why no one used our original tool. It was using old data that wasn't maintained and missing critical pieces of information. So we collected four data sets from each of the housing agencies. We cleaned, deduplicated, organized, and standardized that data into a single database. Then we created Austin's first affordable housing data hub and portal. Each agency now could maintain and view this data all in one place. Finally, we had a single source of truth about the state of affordable housing in Austin, Texas. The next step was to share that data and bridge the second gap between government and residents. We updated our original search tool to use this new source of data via an open API. This ensures that anyone who wants to use the data in the future can have access to it. We then redesigned the original search tool based on interviews with residents. We found that residents searching for affordable housing tend to have more barriers due to issues with credit scores and broken leases. They could spend hours, if not weeks, calling properties one by one to find out if they were eligible. The new search tool shortens that process to a matter of minutes. But the search tool doesn't just help residents find affordable housing. It also creates a feedback loop, allowing government to better understand what residents are looking for and where. In the last election, a $250 million bond was passed for affordable housing. Analytics about the supply and demand of affordable housing can help ensure we make the best use of that money. This is a blessing. In user testing with our first 30 Haka voucher holders, seven began to cry. This tool goes beyond data and technology. It touches people's lives. This tool is live in beta, hosted by the city's Communications and Technology Management Department. It is now the foundation for tracking the Austin Strategic Housing Blueprint goals, and Code for America has laid that foundation. Moving forward, data and agreement are the lifeblood for a living tool that helps us make policy decisions to ensure a diverse and affordable Austin. This project is and continues to be a huge collaborative effort that includes multiple government agencies and nonprofits. It's a testament to the power of teamwork, and it underscores the willingness of people to take up arms against a crisis in their community. It's also a testament to bridging gaps of information between people with data. We've strengthened the relationships between the government agencies who now have a single source of truth and a common language with which to talk about affordable housing. But even more importantly, we've strengthened the relationships between government and its constituents by building a system that connects the services that governments provide with the people that they're charged with serving. Have we solved the affordable housing crisis in Austin? No. It's a systemic problem hundreds of years in the making. But can we bridge the gap between people, between a place of unknowing and a place of truth? Yes, data can bridge that gap. And we hope that this bridge will carry the mission forward for years to come. Please join us in welcoming Code for America's Senior Manager for the Network Talent Initiative, Hashim Mteuzi, to introduce the 2019 Code for America Fellows. Good morning. I love that picture. <laughs> what you just saw with last year's Austin Fellowship team was truly a great example of the progress that can be made 
towards a common goal to address a pressing need when we collaborate as a community. The Community Fellowship represents a microcosm of Code for America's theory of change, where projects themselves show what's possible on critical issues. Partnership with local government helps to build capacity and show others how to do it themselves. And connections with the brigade network and community partners build the movement around the work. Each fellowship is an opportunity for Code for America to reaffirm how we make change in the world and to demonstrate impact on urgent issues that affect those most vulnerable. To further illustrate this, I'd now like to present to you the 2019 class of the Code for America Community Fellowship. Fellows, please join me on stage. Let's show some love to the 2019 class. All right. So proud to be standing up here right now. In Buffalo, we have Mike and Harshita, who will be working on providing access to affordable water. In Charlotte, we have Jill and Jeffrey, who will be working on a reentry roadmap to help formerly incarcerated people better navigate the resources that they need. In Durham, we have Laura and Jacob, who are working to create tools to understand who is currently participating in city processes and then increase equitable community engagement. Let me move out of the way. In Indianapolis, we have Christina, Christina and Michelle, who will be working to design digital resources to facilitate reentry of formerly incarcerated people and connect them to aftercare services. Then in Miami, we have Gregory, Ezra, and Whitney, who will build on the work of last year's Austin team and create an affordable housing data hub in the city of Miami. Then working in Santa Monica, we have Maria May and Miley, who aim <clears throat> to make affordable housing data more accessible. And in Savannah, we have Carl, Nichelle, and Rob, who use data to empower underserved communities to combat sea level rise. Please give another round of applause to the 2019 Community Fellows as they exit the stage. Thank you. Thank you. How about one more time? A little more love. Now, if you're feeling as inspired as I am, and you're interested in what these amazing fellows might accomplish in the next six months, there are three ways that you can get involved and support this work. Visit codeforamerica.org fellowship for more information on the projects and teams. Email fellowship at codeforamerica.org to find out how to bring the community fellowship to your city in 2020. And join your local brigade at brigade.codeforamerica.org to get involved in public interest tech projects in your community. And now, for you don't have to be a techie to do civic tech, please welcome Code for America's very own Meredith Horowski, our senior program director of the Brigade Network. Hello, everyone. I'm Meredith Rowski. I'm the Senior Director of the Brigade Network at Code for America. Thank you all so much for being here to tackle what I think is one of the most pressing challenges of our generation, and that's how to restore faith in our public institutions to meet the scale of the crisis that we are in today and to live up to the promise of our democracy. It's a massive undertaking, so I'm so thrilled to introduce you to two of the people who are helping to lead that charge, Veronica Young and Zachary Antoyan. Wait, I'm not done yet. Veronica is a, she's a program manager at Code for America, where she's a master at supporting our distributed network of 25,000 volunteers who are bringing the Code for America vision to life across the country. Zachary works for assembly member Joaquin Arambula, and he brings some thoroughly non-technical experience to start Code for Fresno and has kicked off some incredible projects in the process, which he'll tell you about. Please join me in welcoming Veronica and Zach.
Thank you, Veronica. So if you're unfamiliar with the Brigade Network, broadly, we are volunteer groups of community members with a bunch of different sets of skills who meet consistently to build or help build digital tools for the public good. Designers help government websites become easier to use and understand. Community organizers identify community needs. Government representatives help communicate with local agencies. Since 2012, brigades and the brigadiers have used those skills to drive to change across the country, from Alaska to Florida, Texas to Maine, Minnesota to Hawaii. Overall, there are 76 brigades working in cities big and small. So, what is it the brigades do? Brigades work on projects to help their local communities, often working with local government partners and local community organizations. You may know us through some of our work like CourtBot, which has helped communities throughout the United States navigate the criminal justice system, or you may know us from our famous hackathons. But the idea that we're just a group of techies is a little bit misunderstood. Um, we do a lot of our work and have a lot of impact in the work that we do through our non-technical work that requires very little to no technical skills. This is us. Almost one-third of brigade members identify as non-techies or don't work in technical roles. So as mentioned, um, I'm one of the co-captains at the recently formed Code for Fresno in the heart of California. Um, I don't have a background in tech or design. I studied political science and philosophy, so when I left college, I was twice as unemployable. Um, <laughs> but the, through a stroke of luck and an interest in engaging in the Fresno community, I found myself working in a legislative office, the 31st Assembly District, where for the last couple of years, I've been working as a liaison between the state government uh, the constituents that live in the district and state agencies. It's my job to help constituents navigate the state bureaucracy and connect them with local resources, uh, sort of like a bureaucratic maze runner. So to some extent, I'm in the trenches of bureaucracy, and that gives me this uh, on-the-ground experience with constituent frustrations. That experience was a driver for getting Code for Fresno off the ground, and it continuously informs and supports the work we do at Code for Fresno um, by in trying to lower uh, the institutional barriers to government services. Uh, in fact, our most recent event this last, uh, last Sunday was something of like a response to the issues that I hear about from constituents on a near daily basis regarding a particular agency. Spoiler alert, it's the DMV. Um, we designed these uh, DMV website uh, user feedback sessions uh, that are happening at brigades uh, across California. Uh, the cool thing about these sessions is that they require very little technical experience to participate in, and they're really good for introducing people to the broader civic tech movement. Uh, Code for Fresno is always looking for uh, ways to engage people of all backgrounds and experiences, and since myself and my co-captain Issa don't have backgrounds in tech from the get-go, Code for Fresno was interested in engaging the non-tech residents uh, and giving them ways to contribute to the cause. So one of the projects that requires little to no technical experience actually comes from Open Oakland, which is the local brigade chapter here in Oakland, California. By now, you're familiar with the work of Clear My Record, and the first version of Clear My Record was actually just a simple form that you would fill out, almost like a survey, with accompanying documentation in order to apply for record clearance. So one of the librarians at the Oakland Public Library reached out to Open Oakland and asked them whether they'd be able to help community members and their neighbors navigate through this form in order to apply for record clearance. So now, once a month, members of Open Oakland go to the Oakland Public Library and help their community members walk through the process of Clear My Record. All you have to do to volunteer is commit to a few hours a month and go through training in order to learn how to fill out the form. To date, Open Oaklanders have contributed over 50 volunteer hours to their local community members to help them walk through this record clearance form. So continuing along that uh, low-tech, civic-tech vein, um, a common issue for families and children during the summer is access to food, considering that while on summer break, lunches and breakfasts aren't provided by schools as they are during the school year. So in response, Code for Tulsa developed Food for Thought in partnership with Hunger Free Oklahoma, which shows families places around the city to find meals, uh, around the state, actually, sorry. Uh, the application is mobile-friendly, an important element, and was not only easy to build, but is also 
easy to update as it relies mostly on data collection and Google spreadsheet information. Uh, data collection and community outreach are common needs in brigade projects and are ideal areas for volunteers that are not coding savvy. This is yet another example of how non-tech volunteers can play critical roles. So by now you're wondering how can you get involved or what can you do to support this work? Oh goodness. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I know a lot of you work in uh, government, uh, where did it go? I know a lot of you work in government uh, agencies or uh, government adjacent roles and there are a lot of ways for you guys to get involved and they should be up there. But um, the first way is that you can see if there's a brigade near you at uh, brigade.codeforamerica.org. If there is one near you, uh, great, join it, please. Uh, if not, consider starting one. Uh, Code for America staff is fantastic in this regard. Uh, Code for Fresno, the, the support that Code for Fresno has received uh, over the last couple of months has made the literal difference. And finally, uh, code, uh, brigade members and volunteers and leaders are always looking for support from local agencies, government representatives, as well as willing to partner uh, on local projects. You don't have to be a technologist to be a part of this broad civic tech movement. Um, and if we're going to start restoring faith in our institutions, we need everyone to show up to help with the tools that they already have. I hope you'll join us. Thank you. Thank you. To introduce the story of taking Get Cal Fresh statewide, please welcome Jens Egerland, Senior Managing Director for the State of California at Accenture. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jens Egerland, and I'm, uh, I run our California practice for Accenture. Um, we're proud to be here. This is our, uh, I think, third uh, third year being here, and. Um, uh, we like digging in with you all on some of the, the toughest problems that are facing uh, government in this digital age. Um, today I've got the pleasure of introducing um, uh, the next speakers. Back in 2013, Code for America noticed that uh, applicants for food stamps were having a difficult time um, making, them, making, uh, uh, making applications and, and getting the benefits that they needed. Um, they recognize the need to reinvent that, um, and that eventually turned into a partnership with uh, the state of California to develop Get Cal Fresh. Um, the way it works is that uh, Code for America is able to observe what's going on in the counties. We, we know that um, uh, SNAP is, uh, is administered down at the county level. Um, but what they're able to do is observe and really figure out what the barriers are that are preventing elig uh, eligible uh, individuals from accessing benefits. And so there's a loop that goes between um, uh, uh, Code for America, the counties, and, and then the state. And, and those insights are shared, and so that, uh, that feedback loop drives process change down at the counties. The, the real um, benefit of all of this is, of course, the clients. And, um, you know, this is what we're all striving for. If you look at the results um, that uh, Get CalFresh has able, been able to deliver, is they've been able to reduce the amount of time um, that it takes to, to get benefits by 75%. Um, and actually increased the application rates in the counties that it's used. Um, and really the, uh, the, the value of this and the key to the success of this is a partnership between Code for America and uh, California Department of Social Services. And Kim McCoy Wade has been the leader in that, in seeing the need to do this and drive um, increased uh, food stamp rates. Um, throughout all of the counties. Tomorrow is going to be uh, a big day um, for people receiving um, uh, CalFresh food stamps and they're going to be um, uh, accessing and, and making new functionality available uh, as part of the Get uh, CalFresh app. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce, uh, well, the, the person also on the Code for America side is Caitlin Docker and um, been working closely with, uh, with Kim uh, to make this all happen. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Caitlin Docker and Kim, Mc Kim McCoy Wade.
Get CalFresh started as a protest. The status quo was that people had to fill out 200 questions over 55 unique screens to apply for food assistance. They couldn't save their progress or go back, and then they had to go over many of those same questions again in an interview. The result was less than two-thirds of people who are eligible for SNAP in California received the benefit. In 2014, our work to enroll every eligible Californian started by simplifying the application process. We built a single-page web form with the only four questions required to be a legal application under federal law. The web form filled out a PDF, faxed it to the county who determines eligibility. And our clients said it worked. Our first year, we assisted about 1,000 SNAP applications in one county. Yesterday, Get Cal Fresh assisted more than 4,000 applications statewide. Yeah. That's more than 9,000 people helped in a single day. Sometimes there's more than one person on each application. I'll save you the math. By the end of this year, five years after we started this journey, Get CalFresh will help more than a million people access food assistance. Yeah. Get CalFresh started in San Francisco and expanded across the Bay, focused on remote populations in the far north, students along the Central Coast, and families in the Central Valley, added the great state of Los Angeles. <laughs> And today, I am excited to finally announce that Get Cal Fresh is officially statewide. Yeah. Want to thank and give a shout out to all of our county partners who are here with us today. I see some of you out there. Um, in partnership with all 58 counties, we're finally able to serve Californians with ease and dignity. And I just want to pause and ask him to put this in perspective. Uh, well, it's right on time, uh, because tomorrow, this week, two big things are happening. Uh, not just that Get Cal Fresh is going statewide, thanks to the deep partnership with our 58 counties, but also the biggest expansion of SNAP in the nation's history is happening tomorrow, as we welcome 800,000 uh, older adults and people with disabilities who receive SSI to Cal Fresh for the first time in the program's history. Yeah. Back one. So people say, some people had said that technology is not for this customer, and we actually disagree. We think that older adults do use technology, people with disabilities use technology, and it can save them from having to travel, come in, they often have caregivers who are adults, uh, logging on late at night, and we know that's super important for them as well. But this is so much more than technology. It's about constantly improving, and they're never done. I love that they don't think just inside the regulations, although, of course, we do follow the regulations, USDA. Uh, <laughs> and second, they hit those deadlines, but they never consider it a deadline. We are constantly improving. We know we hit a deadline, and it's going to get better and change maybe even the next day. And part of that's so important with the CalFresh program, the food stamp program nationally, is the application is the easy part. After the application, we have an interview, and we need to verify those documents. And it's critical that we help our, our clients get through all three of those steps. But unfortunately, we've made great progress on docs. We told you about that last year. That interview, boy, that interview is our challenge to connect with people and get them across the finish line. Yeah, nearly 30% of applicants tell Get CalFresh that they are denied because they missed that interview. So that's what we're tackling next. We found that clients don't have input on that interview appointment time, and they wouldn't know that they missed their, well, we wouldn't know that a client missed their interview for more than 120 days with the lag of getting data and outcomes. So we decided to just ask clients real time why they were in that application process. Have you had your interview yet? So we could provide support and intervene. If a client says yes, great. Make sure that you upload any outstanding documents that the county asks for. If not, then let's help you reconnect to that interview. One of our partners in Los Angeles pointed out the clients are working when the county is working. So we shouldn't be too surprised that more than half the applicants miss the original appointment time that the county set and need to reschedule. 
We haven't solved this problem yet, but client reminders reduce denials due to missed interview by 5% statewide, and Kim's team is partnering with the counties to learn more and rethink this business process. So we told you that CalFresh expansion is coming on Saturday, and man, has the word already gotten out. <laughs> We know more people are applying right now than ever before, and county backlogs are growing, call center wait times are increasing. So we're holding two things in tension. Clients are eligible for benefits. We want to connect them right away. But we also want them to have a positive experience when they're interacting with the counties. So on Monday, Get CalFresh will update with a message maybe like this, we're still working on it, it's in development, to let clients know that Counties are experiencing a higher volume. To hang tight, they are important. We see them. We're going to help them get through this process. And this is just our first step in working toward a larger solution this summer and the months ahead. So what we're showing here is Get CalFresh is so much more than a website. It is both the medicine for what ails us, more applications, and the diagnostic. Why are we sick? Uh, these business processes are helping our clients and our counties rethink how we connect and how we stay to connect, and that we can then scale it up to serve the two million people we serve every year. And of course, we cannot be comfortable only reaching the two-thirds. We have to go get that missing million. There's a couple reasons why it's so critical for this, this to happen, at the risk of stating the obvious. If people don't have food, we will not be able to have the health and equity that we need in California to truly be a California for all. Particularly right now with the housing crisis, rent always eats first. People are going hungrier at levels that have not been true for a long time in our state, and we got to get CalFresh and we got to solve the housing crisis as well. It's also critical for equity. We are seeing incredible uh, declines, unfortunately, in people speaking languages other than English, partly due to the climate. But we also want to make sure that our technology is available in all those languages. Grateful for the Spanish and so happy to announce that traditional Chinese, Get CalFresh will be in traditional Chinese beginning in July. So thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. But let me be clear, they, uh, this is hopefully providing a transformative experience for our clients and making it easy to get CalFresh uh, and have that food that provides that platform. But the real transformation is happening with us, and we are so grateful for that. California is at an incredible moment technology-wise as we move from three eligibility systems to one eligibility system. June is a big month in California. June is a big We're month. moving to one eligibility system, uh, and it's critical that we take these transformative lessons forward, that we need think about how we deliver our services, put our customer first, change our own business processes, how we measure risk, and how we measure success. Because ultimately, success is measured in the people we serve, not the deadline, not the budget, not the staffing, but the people we serve. Our families and communities will be stronger because of our success at serving all these people together. We're so inspired by the CalFresh team to be, be, be better, be different, to think different, to think work differently, uh, and grateful to take that forward. And with that, we want to end where we always begin, by listening to the stories that drive us, that feed us, and that got us to this point. Thank you, Get CalFresh. Thank you, Code. Thank you. All right. Wow, congratulations to the Get CalFresh team. That's incredible. It's fantastic work and a great, great, great announcement for the end of... Absolutely, and to the Clear My Record team and to the 2019 Code for America fellows. All kinds of good news happening here today. So, we're nearly, in the, we're nearly at the end, we're in the home stretch. I think we've had some fantastic and amazing speakers so far. And there's more to come. We have another full day of great speakers and events. As we mentioned, this room will continue to feature our track keynotes. So up next after the break, we'll feature our civic innovation track keynotes. After lunch, we've got digital delivery and uh, GovOps. We've got breakouts, lightning talks, the civic tech timeline. All of the things. All of the things. And all of you. Um, we'd like to also give one more big round of applause and a huge thanks to the 20 or so volunteers who served on our 2019 Summit Content Committee who put together this entire program and have been tirelessly running around, wrangling all the breakout sessions and keeping us in line. So thank you so much to the Content Committee.
And I just have, um, I just have one last request before we, before we close out, uh, which is that yesterday I was FaceTiming with my kids over dinner, um, and I was talking to my eldest, and he said, Daddy, why are you at work in a mall? Because I was standing by the escalator during reception, and there was just everyone milling around. And um, if you would indulge me, if I could grab a photo of everyone so I can prove to him that I'm not actually shopping. But you better bring something back, yeah. right? All right, well, that's it for us. Um, but to close us out this morning, we'd like to welcome back to the stage Code for America founder and executive director, Jennifer Polka. Hi, everybody. Um, I appreciate the big round of applause for our wonderful uh, content committee. We now also need to have a big round of applause uh, for Dan and Corey, the co-chairs over the event today. You. you guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Flowers from our local o Oakland flower shop. So Dan and Corey are not just, you know, telling stories of other folks, though I think they do that beautifully. They do the work. They've been doing the work for years. They understand the meat of this. They understand what all of you are going through. And they, I think they've reflected it so beautifully in pulling um, an event together that I'm super proud of and uh, hope that you were too. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I have a couple more thanks, though. I'll start off by saying we also have a town hall at the end of the day today. Does anyone know what room it's in? No, well, doesn't matter. You can figure it out. It's in your little app or in your little book. And um, we hope that you'll come, uh, and it's sort of a time for us to sort of process together uh, a lot of what happened, your feelings about the event, your feelings about where this work is going, where you want it to go, what you want to come back to next. So I hope you'll show up for that. Um, I have a number of thank yous, but we're going to save some of them for that town hall, so, so please show up. I have a particular thank you that I'd asked for a little bit of time with all of you on, and you may not all know this person, um, but ST Mayer came to us about four years ago and has been our chief program officer for most of that time. And Code for America was a wonderful and somewhat chaotic <laughs> place when she came, um, and she has made it something so much better and so much different and really is secretly so responsible for so much of the progress that we keep talking about every year, moving the bar, getting deeper in the work, having it uh, be more tied to policy and process, more tied to human outcomes. And she's leaving us after this summit, and I cannot let her go without not only thanking her personally, but having all of us give her a really, really warm and heartfelt thanks for all that she's done for this larger community. Can you come out, please, ST? <laughs> ST Mayor. And like me, uh, she is not really leaving. She's moving to some new position on the field because she is always going to be part of this work, always going to be demonstrating an amazing style of leadership that brings work forward. And um, you're, this is not the last you're going to see of her, right? Definitely not. Okay. <laughs> Made her you. promise in front Thanks of everybody. You. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, ST. <clears throat> That's a hard one, yeah. Um, so just a couple more announcements. We've been talking about um, our bigger tent, um, and we're pitching this tent on the East Coast next year, uh, March 11th through 13th. We're going to DC. We're moving into the belly of the beast. Uh, and we, I know that's for a lot of you um, that, are, uh, that come from the West Coast, and this is an easy trip. I apologize for making you go across the country, especially when it might still be snowing in DC. Um, but I think it's going to be a really interesting dynamic. And um, I know a lot of you who have made the trek from the East Coast or from Europe or wherever it is you're coming from, um, you've actually you've wanted it to not just be a West Coast event, and we're going to try it out. Um, I'm super excited about it. It's two months earlier than this year, so it's basically happening like tomorrow, and we need to get started working on it. Um, but uh, I'm, we're already 
already looking forward to that. We're already looking forward to hopefully all of you coming and um, as, as Rebecca and others do, bringing, bringing more people along. So DC, March 11th through 13th, you know, it doesn't hurt to just put on your calendar now. You all have calendars that go into next year. Um, I mentioned that we have um, the town hall at the end of the day. We also have ELGL's wonderful GovLove podcast happening at the same time. So if you're not uh, interested in coming and processing with us, go to that. It's going to be super amazing. And then there'll just be a whole bunch of people milling around, uh, talking and having a wonderful time. So I'm looking forward to the rest of the day, as well as all the sessions uh, that Dan and Corey talked about. Um, all right, just a final note so we can let you go and talk with each other and you, you go to your sessions. Um, as you walk out of this room and into the hallways, and then as you um, go get in your Ubers or Lyfts or BART, hopefully you bar some of you BART or bike and, and either go home, you know, get on a plane or just go home if you live in the Bay Area, um, just take a moment as you're leaving to think about what this meant for you and what you're taking away from it. It's just a good time to pause and think and think about what you want to have happen when you come back together with this group next year. Um, I think. One thing that's obvious, and we, we talk about it a lot, but is that deep and sustainable change simply isn't possible without these human connections. And I'm talking about the human connections that we have here, but also the reminders that when we're talking about government services that operate at a normal scale, we're talking about data, uh, we're talking about, as uh, Kate and Kim just did, serving people you know, in the millions uh, with important services. Um, we use a lot of numbers, and there are real people behind those numbers, not just the real people who get to come to this event, uh, but the real people who aren't in the room, um, but whose voices need to be represented. And um, I would ask you just to think about those human connections uh, as you leave here and ask yourself, what new, stronger connections are you going to bring into this metaphorical tent, into this work? Uh, so reflect on that throughout the day. Go have a, a wonderful afternoon, and I hope to see you at the Town Hall or the GovLove podcast, and of course, next year in D.C. Thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs>